Hola, bienvenidos a Saddleback en Español. Gracias por estar con nosotros el día de hoy. Soy el Pastor Will, aquí el Pastor de Saddleback en Español. Y hoy tenemos a Andrés. Hola Andrés, ¿cómo estás? Hola Will, ¿cómo estás? ¿Cómo están todos en sus casas? Bueno, justamente soy Andrés Ferreira, director de Alabanza de Saddleback en Español. Andrés, cuéntanos, sé que ya estamos un tiempo en esta uh, cuarentena y cuéntanos cómo está tu familia, cómo has estado tú, uh, cómo has estado en esta temporada de tu vida. Mira, Will, Dios ha sido bueno, uh, la verdad que no nos podemos quejar, uh, estamos con salud, estamos eh, constantemente buscando a Dios porque esta temporada es muy difícil, uno puede entrar fácilmente en algún tipo de pensamiento pesimista o de depresión o sentirse lejos de los seres amados, así que hemos estado en constante contacto con la familia. Tú sabes, muchos de nosotros tenemos familias eh, en otros países, así que la nuestra está en Argentina, está en Brasil, en Uruguay, así que hemos estado llamándonos por teléfono y demás. Y Dios ha sido bueno, como te dije, también el trabajo no nos ha faltado, así que es una bendición para nosotros y orando siempre por todos aquellos que no la están pasando tan bien en esta temporada. Así es, eso es muy importante, seguir conectados con nuestra familia en Latinoamérica, muy, muy cierto. Si tú hoy nos visitas de Latinoamérica, hey, dinos de dónde nos estás visitando el día de hoy. Ahí en el chat pon de qué país nos visitas o si nos visitas de una ciudad aquí en el condado de Orange o California. Déjanos saber, nos encantaría conocerte y conocer de dónde nos visitas. Y si hoy es tu primera vez visitándonos aquí en nuestro servicio en línea, te animo a que nos dejes saber. Manda un texto con la palabra primera vez al número 97000 y así te enviamos todo lo que tú necesitas para ser parte de esta familia de Saddleback en español. Ahora Dios sigue orando de una manera grandiosa aquí en nuestra iglesia. Miremos todo lo que está pasando aquí en Saddleback Church. Hey Saddleback, you've heard Pastor Rick saying that the church has never stopped being the church in these past few months. Another thing that hasn't stopped is people finding new life and purpose in Jesus. This week we want to celebrate these changed lives. Our church family has been growing and our new members have recently had an opportunity to be baptized at the beach. Baptism is a powerful declaration that our old life has gone and a new life has begun. I struggled a lot with depression and anxiety and things like that. Even though I consider myself a Christian, I really didn't want to take it too seriously, but I just saw Shema find peace in her life. So I just um, thought to myself, well, if Shema can just have a change, I should be able to have a change myself. Started off at rehab. After that, I, I went to two different halfway houses, started going to church, really started to hear the word, and uh, I started to really get into it. Since I've become closer to God and decided to devote my life to Jesus, my days and my life has been filled with so much more joy and I, I feel full. With this baptism in my life, I'm going to try harder to be more positive and I'm going to try to find good thing in everything. I'm healed now. I don't have to worry about the old. I'm in the new. Joining a small group is a great next step after being baptized. Being in a small group is about doing life together and being in community with other people who are growing in their faith. In late April, a Saddleback member named Kittrick was hospitalized for a week with COVID-19. As his health rapidly declined, he let his small group know what was happening. In fact, he says they saved his life. So let's chat with Kittrick now. Kittrick, I'm so glad to see that you're doing better, but I wanted to hear what it was like to recover from COVID-19. If it wasn't for my small group, I, I, wouldn't, I would not be here. My small group came through for me like you wouldn't believe. If people weren't praying, uh, which was so valuable, they were doing something. It was just always just uh, prayers being lifted up for me. And a lot of people just hit the road and they, they went to the grocery store to get things that I couldn't do myself. Why do you think small groups are important in general and particular in times of crisis? It was one small group member that said, when it came to me meet, needing uh, help to get things from the store, he said, don't steal my joy. It was then that it finally hit me that these people are just motivated by the love of God. 
and that they wanted to help. It really put a new perspective into uh, the way I look at things and, and my small group. Kittrick, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We're, we're so thankful that you joined us today. Sure, thank you. It's incredible to see how God is moving in the lives of our church and community. So we'll be back next week with more stories for you. Wow, Dios está haciendo cosas increíbles en nuestra iglesia, ¿no es así? Estamos viendo todos los fines de semana cuán grande y bueno es Dios y cuán impactante es nuestra comunidad de iglesia justamente de nuestras ciudades. Así que estoy muy feliz. Y también quiero anunciarles a todos ustedes, Will, también, esto es para ti una novedad. El próximo viernes 14 de agosto, próximo viernes 14 de agosto, ya le estaremos informando el horario. Vamos a tener por primera vez una noche de adoración compartida junto con el campus de Salva Buenos Aires en Argentina. Así es, los dos equipos, el equipo de Worship de Buenos Aires y el equipo de Worship de Salva en Español, vamos a estar unidos en una noche poderosa de adoración donde no solamente vas a poder participar y disfrutar de alabanzas y adorar con nosotros, pero también un momento donde vamos a poder ministrar tu vida, donde vamos a poder compartir y entregar a Dios todo lo que nos está preocupando en sus pies y a sus pies. Y no solamente eso, hay un montón de invitados, pero no puedo decir nada todavía. Pero creo que también vos fuiste novedades, ¿verdad? Sí, así es. Y algo que soy muy emocionado de anunciar, lo dijimos la semana pasada, pero... El próximo domingo, el 2 de agosto, empezamos con un nuevo servicio, un nuevo horario de servicio. Cada domingo, empezando a las 11 a.m., tenemos nuestro servicio en línea, Iglesia en Casa. Pero lo bonito de todo esto, Andrés, es que no solamente vamos a tener nuestro servicio en línea, pero también al mismo tiempo vamos a tener reuniones de Saddleback Kids y de Saddleback Students, reuniones para tus hijos, y reuniones para los jóvenes. Va a ser un tiempo de iglesia en casa. Estoy muy emocionado. So, te espero el próximo domingo, no a las 2, sino a las 11 a.m. aquí en Facebook y también YouTube Live. Qué buenas noticias, ¿no? Hay mucho para celebrar y mucho nuevo se viene por delante. Pero ahora sí, está, este es el tiempo que disfrutamos eh, muchísimo, es el tiempo de adoración junto con todos ustedes donde podemos derramar el corazón a Dios vamos a cantar, donde quieras que estés abrí tu corazón, tu mente y mientras que estás cantando estas palabras, habla a Dios y pedí todo lo que necesites agradezcamos juntos y adoramos juntos en esta tarde de adoración Estoy listo para hacer tu voluntad Hacia adelante a ti te seguiré Y ya estoy listo para hacer tu voluntad Derrama tu presencia Dios
de tu casa Me permites recibir Cada sueño en él hay preocupación Ya cubierto está por ti Está sobrando, Señor. Aunque no pueda ver, está sobrando. Aunque no pueda ver, está sobrando. Siempre estás, siempre estás sobrando. Siempre estás, siempre estás sobrando. Aunque no pueda ver, está sobrando. Aunque no pueda ver, está sobrando. Siempre estás, siempre estás sobrando. Siempre estás, siempre estás sobrando, aunque no pueda ver, estás sobrando, aunque no siempre estás sobrando, 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 siempre estás siempre estás sobrando, aunque no pueda ver, estás sobrando, aunque no pueda ver, estás sobrando. Hi everybody, I'm Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, author of The Purpose Driven Life and speaker at uh, the Daily Hope broadcast. Welcome back to our special series on principles for living through a pandemic. Now today is our 17th study in the book of James that I'm calling A Faith That Works When Life Doesn't. 
And I'm calling this particular message a faith that makes me more merciful and less judgmental. A faith that makes me more merciful and less judgmental. But before we dive in, uh, let me give you some practical ways to get the most out of these online messages while we're unable to meet due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me give you some suggestions. Number one, find a comfortable chair. Okay, just sit down, don't stand, find a comfortable chair. Number two, print up the outline. We send it to you every week and an email. If you're not getting it, give us your email and we'll send it to you. Number three, turn your phone off. Turn your phone off. And number four, don't multitask. You'll get a whole lot more out of God's word if you'll do those four things. Now, a while back, uh, there was a Christian organization that took a national survey of people who aren't believers. And uh, one of the questions was that they asked was, what word best describes your impression of the Christians you know? And the answer was not, unfortunately, they're loving or they're kind or they're humble or they're generous or they have integrity. The number one answer that people gave when they were asked what one word describes Christians you know, they said, the Christians I know are judgmental, are judgmental. Now, that means we're not doing a very good job of representing Jesus in our world today because that's the exact opposite of what Jesus said he came to do. Now, every Christian knows the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But sadly, most Christians pay no attention to the very next verse right after it, John 3, 17, which says this. I did not come into this world to judge the world. I came to save it. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. If you're serious about becoming like Jesus, then your life mission must be the same as his. And Jesus didn't save you to become a judge of people, but to save people by pointing them to Jesus, the savior. That's why today in our 17th message through this book of James, we're going to focus on the implication of just one phrase of one verse in the book of James. That verse is James chapter two, verse 13. Here's what it says. You must show mercy to others or God won't show mercy to you when he judges you one day. But the person who shows mercy will stand without fear at the judgment on judgment day. And then here's the phrase that I want us to focus on. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What I want us to focus on is this last phrase. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does that mean? What does it mean for your life in the middle of a global pandemic? Well, first, let's start with a simple definition of mercy. What's mercy? Well, in a simplified form, mercy is love in action. Mercy is not a feeling. It's far more than a feeling. You do something with mercy. You show mercy. Mercy is love in action. But this verse and others say that mercy is also the opposite of judging and judgment. Mercy is the opposite of judging and judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is different than judgment. And when I'm judging other people, I am not being merciful. Now, God says that mercy is more powerful than judgment. It triumphs over judgment. It beats being judged. It prevails. It wins. It carries the day over judgment. You know, we should be grateful for that. Because if we all got what we deserve, none of us would be alive. Everything in your life and in my life is due to God's mercy. Everything that we have, the air, the water, life itself. And today, what I want to do as we look at this theme, mercy triumphs over judgment, is ask two questions. Number one, why does God expect me to show mercy to everybody? everybody. And number two, how does God expect me to show mercy to everybody? Okay, let's look at these two. What does the Bible say? First, why does God expect me to show mercy to everyone? Let me give you just four reasons from God's word. Number one, because God continually shows me mercy. 
As I said, every breath you take is because of God's mercy. Every beat of your heart is an example of God's mercy. Every new day you wake up is because of God's mercy. God is a merciful God. It is emphasized all through scripture. Now look at this verse, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so very much that when we were spiritually dead and doomed because of our sins, he gave us a new life in Christ. Now notice, it says in that verse, we were spiritually dead and doomed. When you're dead, there's nothing you can do about it. You don't have any power to change your life. No self-help book will help you when you're dead. You're just stuck. And when you're doomed, it's hopeless. You need a savior. You see, it is God's mercy that keeps you and me alive. It's God's mercy that saves us. It's God's mercy that keeps us out of hell. It's God's mercy that saves us from a lot of trouble that we cause by our own problems. Now, God expects you to pass on his undeserved mercy to others. You don't deserve it. No, nobody else does either. But he says, I want you to pass it on. Matthew 18, 33. Shouldn't you have mercy on others just as I had mercy on you? So the first reason we're to show mercy to everybody is because God shows us mercy. Number two, we're to show mercy to everyone because, number two, God wants me to become like him. Yeah, God's a merciful God. He wants you to be like him, like father, like daughter, like father, like son. Hosea chapter six, verse six, God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want you to be merciful. Now, this verse, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't, I don't, I want you to be merciful. This Old Testament verse is so important. Jesus quotes it twice in the gospel, twice. This may shock you, but God says, showing mercy is more important than worship. So I don't want your sacrifice if you're not showing mercy to other people. This has enormous implications for you and me right now while we can't meet together for worship during COVID-19. God says, okay, you can't worship together right now, but you can show mercy to people during this pandemic. You know, while other churches uh, around the world have been worrying about how to get the community back into the church during COVID-19, Saddleback took the exact opposite strategy and we've been using taking the church into the community. One of the ways is by providing free food for tens of thousands of out of work families. You know, this week, Saddleback Church was ranked the number one food provider in Southern California. That's because of your financial gifts and that's because of your volunteering. We are showing mercy when we can't worship together. He says, that's okay, I, I, I'll get that. You show, you're worshiping me when you show mercy to people who need it. Now, it's no big secret what God wants you to do. Look at this verse, Micah chapter six, verse eight. It's very clear. It's not, he's not hiding it from us. God has clearly shown you what is good. Okay, it's, it's not like you're wondering what's good. God has clearly shown you what's good and how he expects you to live. And then he says three things. You must treat everyone justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. Note the three things God expects you to do in life. It's not complicated. Number one, treat everyone justly, liberty and justice for all. Love mercy, that's what James is talking about in this verse, mercy triumphs over judgment, and walk humbly before God, which by the way, is the root of the other two things. If I treat people unjustly, or I'm in judgment, I'm judgmental instead of merciful, it just shows my pride and my ego and my arrogance. I'm not being humble. So we are to walk justly, do justice with people. We're to love mercy and we're to walk humbly before God. Now there's a third important reason that God expects me to show mercy to everybody. Not just the people I wanna show it to, but to everybody. And it's this, because I need mercy to get into heaven. Yeah, you need mercy to get into heaven. Matthew chapter six, verse 15, Jesus says this, if you refuse to forgive others, your father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Whoa. You cannot, walk, you cannot receive what you're unwilling to give yourself. See, the only way we can get into a perfect heaven is by God's, by God's mercy. 
by his forgiveness, by his, his grace. You cannot afford to burn the bridge that you have to walk across in order to get into heaven. And he says, if you won't show mercy, why would you expect me to show mercy to you? One day, somebody came to the famous pastor, John Wesley, and he said, uh, you know, I could never forgive that person. And he mentioned somebody. And Wesley said, then I hope you never sin. If you can't forgive him, I hope you never sin because you're burning the bridge that you have to walk across in order to get into heaven. Look at that verse again at the top of your outline. James chapter two, verse 13. Let's read it again. You must show mercy to others or God won't show mercy to you when he judges you one day. But the person who shows mercy will stand without fear. He's talking about on the judgment day because mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, he says that's the negative way to say it. On the other hand, Jesus says it positively in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 or 7. He says this, God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. So God is a merciful God. Okay, God is a merciful God. I'm going to need mercy to get into heaven. There's a fourth reason God wants you to be merciful to everybody. And here it is, because being merciful, listen, is a remedy for depression. And a lot of people are depressed right now. They're discouraged, they're depressed, they're down because of this COVID-19. You know, when you stop focusing on your own pain and your own problems and your own difficulties and you start caring about other people and you start showing mercy to other people, you know what it does? It lifts your spirit. It increases your energy. It produces happiness. That beatitude, you know, the word marikos or blessed literally means happy. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus says, happy are the merciful. You want to be happy? Be merciful. Happy are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, who do you think right now in this pandemic, for instance, uh, is, is happier right now? Uh, all those thousands of volunteers at Saddleback, over 12,000 of them, who have been distributing food and supplies to people less fortunate? Do you think they're the most happy? Do you think the people who are sitting at home griping about inconvenient and how tough this pandemic is. Those who are giving their lives away are, I guarantee you, happier than those who are focused only on themselves. Those who are merciful, blessed are the merciful, happy are the merciful. By the way, let me give you the most recent numbers for our grocery distribution as of July 20th. The number of grocery distribution places we have done, 327 different pop-up distribution centers, 327 across Southern California. The number of families served, 63,579 families out of work have been served by Saddleback Church. The number of uh, volunteers that have served, now over 14,505 of you have volunteered. You're showing mercy. And as a result, the number of decisions for Jesus Christ, people have given their life to the Lord through the food pantries and the, and the pop-ups, 8,349 people. All of that while COVID has shut down our worship service. The number of pounds served, 2.8 million pounds of food served by Saddleback. In fact, this last week, Saddleback was named the number one food distributor in Southern California. There, evidently, there's some group that ranks it. And they said, we are the number one ranking uh, uh, distributor of food. What are we doing? We're showing mercy. R rather than sitting at home and griping and complaining and feeling sorry for ourselves and having a pity party. You see, God set up the universe with universal principles. And one of those principles is this, the more you help other people, the more you will succeed and the happier you will be. Happiness doesn't come from living for yourself. It comes from giving your life away and being merciful. Proverbs eleven seventeen, a merciful person helps himself. Did you get that? Look at that verse. A merciful person helps himself, but a cruel person hurts himself. That's the principle of the universe, that you get what you sow in life. Uh, the Living Bible uh, uh, translation of this verse says, your own soul is nourished when you're kind, when you're merciful. 
Now, of course, the greatest example in the Bible is the story of Job, where he lost literally everything. He lost his health. He lost his family. He lost his job. He lost his wealth, everything. His friends came out and you know what they did? They judged him. They didn't show mercy. They criticized him. They second guessed him. They kept telling him what he'd done was wrong. They kept saying, it's your own fault. And the Bible says that the great turnaround in Job's life occurred, not when he thought about himself, but when he actually prayed for the people who were criticizing him. Do you do that? Job 42, verse 10, after Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored Job's wealth and happiness, giving him twice as much as before. In other words, before the crisis that he was in. What I'm trying to point out to you in this message, here's the big idea. You have a choice. You can go through life as a judgmental person, or you can go through life as a merciful person. You can choose to criticize and you can choose to point out flaws and you can choose to condemn and judge everybody who doesn't hold measure up to your standards, which you don't either. And and, and you're going to make yourself and everybody else around you miserable. You make yourself miserable or uh, you can do the opposite. You can be an agent of judgment in the world or you can be an agent of mercy in the world. And if you do that, life will be a whole lot more enjoyable for you. And by the way, for everybody you live with and everybody else around you, it's your choice. So you say, Rick, how do I get started in being an agent of mercy? How can I become God's agent of mercy instead of an agent, instead of an agent of judgmentalism in the world? Well, you start by getting into this book, the Bible. And realizing when you read this book and you really study it, you realize how much mercy matters so much more to God than judgment. God doesn't want to judge. He does it. He'd rather be merciful. Being judgmental of others means you really don't know the Bible as well as you think you do. You see, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, Jesus says this. He tells it to the Pharisees. He says, you would not have judged these men if you really knew the scripture that says, I want you to be merciful. Again, You got a choice, be judgmental, be merciful, be an agent of mercy, be an an agent of justice. Now, we've looked at four reasons God wants you to show mercy to everybody. So we now we have to ask the question, how, how do I do it? How does God expect me to show mercy to everybody? Well, mercy is like a diamond. It's multifaceted. Uh, But in our time together, in just this brief time, let me give you four practical ways to be God's agent of mercy in the world. They're pretty simple. They're not hard to understand, but they're often difficult to do. Number one, forgive people when they mess up. Forgive people when they mess up. That's an agent of mercy. Second Corinthians 2, 7 says this, when people sin, you should forgive and comfort them so they won't give up in despair. That's CEV version. So they won't give up in despair. Forgive the fallen, especially when they've hurt you. You see, the normal reaction is when somebody hurts you, you either want to get even or you want to write them off. But an agent of mercy forgives the fallen. You know, when you pray the Lord's Prayer that Jesus told us to pray, one of the phrases in the Lord's Prayer is this, Luke 11, verse 4. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Do you really want to pray that verse? When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're saying, God, I want you to forgive me as much as I forgive everybody who's hurt me. Do you want to actually pray that prayer? Lord, I want you to forgive me as much as I forgive everybody else who's hurt me. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, whoever refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Who do you need to give another chance to? Who do you need to give a second chance to? That's being an agent of mercy. You know, at Saddleback, we want to be known as the Church of Mercy. That's why the S in our name stands for Second Chance Place of Grace. It's a place to start over. This is for people who don't have it all together, for people who've, who've messed up. We forgive the fallen. We show mercy to people who've messed up. Number two, second way God wants you to show mercy to everybody is this. 
This gets a little bit deeper here. Be patient with people's quirks. <laughs> Be patient with people's quirks. I mean, everybody has their peculiarities, okay? We all have our mannerisms. We, we have our idiosyncrasies. We have our odd behaviors. We have our irritating habits. You say, moi? Yeah, even you, you got them. When you control your anger and you refuse to get upset over somebody who does something irritating, don't look at them right now if they're in your family, but when you refuse to control your anger and you don't get upset, you are showing mercy. Maybe right now during COVID-19 and everybody's stuck at home, the most important marriage advice I could give you is this next verse, Ephesians 4.2. Here's what it says. Be patient with each other making allowances for each other. Are you doing that? Making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. You know the first place you need to show mercy? At home. So many marriages are buried by a lot of little digs, okay? Because we're not showing mercy. Romans 15, seven, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. He's accepted you with all your quirks and idiosyncrasies and faults and weaknesses. He says, this brings glory to God. You wanna bring glory to God? Start accepting your spouse instead of criticizing them all the time, instead of complaining all the time, instead of picking at them all the time. Learn to accept them in their peculiarities, in their weaknesses. Everybody's got them. That's being an agent of mercy in your marriage. And with your kids, everybody's got their faults. Accept them as Christ has accepted you. This brings glory to God. You bring glory to God every time you don't bring up something that bugs you at home. You bring glory to God. James 2, 13 in the Phillips translation says this, the man who makes no allowances for others will find none made for him. You're gonna reap what you sow in life, okay? Let me give you a third way to, to be an agent of mercy. Show respect to people you disagree with. That's showing mercy, yeah. Now we certainly need this one today. In a polarized and divided world. You know, there are a lot of dumb ideas out there, but it, it doesn't mean you can treat them with disrespect. You are to be respectful. You don't have to agree with everything. You can disagree with people without being disagreeable. 1 Peter 2, 17, about as clear as you can get. God says, treat everyone you meet with dignity. Oh my goodness, everybody? Yeah, people I disagree with? Yeah, people that uh, I don't like? Yeah, treat everyone you meet with dignity. We're getting ready to go into the fall where there's gonna be in America an election. That means it's gonna get mean-spirited. There's gonna be attack ads. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says this, it's very clear. Don't get bitter or angry or use harsh words that hurt each other. Don't yell, notice, bitter, angry, harsh words, hurt. Don't yell at one another or curse or ever be rude. Instead, be kind and merciful. That's an agent of mercy. Notice that God contrasts mercy with six negative responses. Go look at that list again. How would you rate yourself on mercy? Are you, are you rude? Do you yell? Do you curse? All those other, those six different things. You see, today, Christians, for instance, are being attacked like never before uh, in a lot of countries. And many groups are pushing anti-Christian agendas. And because we represent their barrier, by being loyal to God, they attack us. What's our response? Show mercy, show mercy. You have to ask yourself, do you wanna win the argument or do you wanna win them to Christ? You, are, you must show mercy. If you're not showing mercy, then, then you're not following Christ. You know, Jesus gets really radical about this. He goes way, way beyond tolerance. In Luke chapter six, verse 35 and 36, Jesus says this, love your enemies. Oh, come on, love your enemies. And then he says, do good to them. What is do good to them? That's mercy. Mercy is love in action. Love your enemies, do good to them. When's the last time you did something good for an enemy? When's the last time you did something good for somebody you totally disagree with? Politically, culturally, relationally, religiously, or whatever. Do good to them. Lend them without expecting anything back. When's the last time you lent them some money 
to an enemy. He said, then your reward will be great. God is gonna reward you. When he sees you acting as an agent of mercy in the world, your reward will be great in heaven. Some of you aren't gonna have any reward in heaven because you haven't been merciful. He says, your reward will be great in heaven and you'll be the children of the most high. That's a great compliment because God is kind. He's merciful to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. So what am I saying? Mercy is giving people what they need, not what they deserve. If we all got what we deserved, we wouldn't be here. And, and when you see people hurting others, realize that hurt people hurt people. Who's hurt you the most? Who's hurt you the most recently? Show them mercy, show them mercy. You know, there's a famous story about uh, President Abraham Lincoln's mercy. After the Southern states were defeated by the Northern states in the Civil War 150 years ago, President Lincoln spoke to a very large crowd from a balcony of the White House. And at the end of his speech, this is after the Civil War and the North had won, ending slavery. At the end of his speech, James Harlan, who was a senator of Iowa, shouted out to to, uh, to uh, President Lincoln, what should we do with the rebels? Those who had fought for the Confederacy. And the unmerciful crowd shouted back, hang them, hang them, hang them, hang them. Lin Lincoln's youngest son was named Tad. He was 11 years old. He's standing by his dad. And he turned to his father, he says, no, no, Papa, not hang them, hang on to them, hang on to them. And Lincoln grinned at his young son, Tad, and said, you're exactly right, son. Tad had the solution. He had the solution for all of the bitterness and betrayal and violence in America and everywhere else. We must hang on to them, not hang them. Show mercy. Finally, number four, help. Help anybody who's hurting. Anytime you help anybody who's hurting, you are an agent of mercy and mercy is triumphing over judgment. You're not being judgmental, you're being merciful. You know, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan to teach real mercy. You help somebody when they need it. Proverbs 3, 27, wherever or whenever you possibly can, do good to those who need it. Now, how do you do poss uh, good wherever you possibly can? You gotta look for it. You gotta look for op opportunities to be merciful this week. If you care, you'll be aware. I call this premeditated mercy. <laughs> it's intentional. I want you as a saddleback person, and so anybody who's watching this today or listening to it on Daily Hope, I want you to practice premeditated mercy this week. I dare you to do something incredibly risky this week. Commit an act of premeditated mercy. So how can you do that? You know, I've been thinking a lot about this. I talked to the staff about it and you're gonna hear more about it. We're gonna do a survey on Monday. But I've been thinking that the first half of this COVID-19 pandemic, our big win was when we started helping people who needed food. And that, as you heard all those statistics earlier, is an amazing success and we've had so many thousands of people come to Christ because we moved into an area and showed mercy to people who needed food. But what about now? You know who I'm most concerned about right now? We just heard this week that the schools aren't gonna open in the fall. I care about the teachers and I care about the parents and I care about the kids. Kids are bored right now at home. Parents are frustrated. And I could go into this in detail, I'll write you about it, but the bottom line is Saddleback is gonna figure out ways, just like we did with food, on how to support our parents, emotionally, spiritually, financially, and how to support our kids. The K in Saddleback is kid and family friendly and how to support teachers. Yeah, we're gonna talk about this in detail in the days ahead. Expect a letter from me this week on this very issue. That's where we're going next. We're gonna show mercy and help parents who are frustrated, trying to cover their own job, single parents who are trying to do it all by themselves, others who are having to work in the home and, and with the kids at home and all these other things. Now, of course, there's always a tension between mercy and responsibility. But you know what I've decided? That if I'm gonna err in life, 
I'm going to come down on the side of being too gracious, too merciful, and too forgiving. I'd much rather be on that side because that's the way God has been with me. You say, well, Rick, can't you go overboard on mercy? Absolutely. I think Jesus did. On the cross, Jesus went overboard with mercy. Now, maybe you've never accepted God's mercy for you. If not, you, you don't even have the power in you to be merciful. Titus 3, 5 says this, Jesus saved us, not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins and he gave us a new life. If you have never received the free gift of God's salvation, where all your sins are washed away, all your past is forgiven, you receive the mercy and grace of God, I want to do it right now. Okay, let's bow our heads. Follow me in this prayer. Say, dear God, I need your mercy in my life. Say that. Dear God, I need your mercy in my life. Jesus Christ, thank you for showing me mercy. Thank you for giving me what I need, not what I deserve. What I need is your forgiveness. What I need is your love. What I need is your power. And today, as much as I know how, I'm opening my life to you. I want to learn to trust you and follow you from, for the rest of my life. And in your mercy, accept me into your heaven one day. Please be my savior and show me mercy. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. Now, this is a very important decision you made. And so you need to tell somebody about it. Why don't you tell me if you committed your life to Christ for the very first time, I want you to get your phone right now. Get out your phone. And I want you to text new start, one word, to 99,000. Text new start to 99,000. If you don't have a phone to text with, you can email me, newstart at saddleback.com. About four or 5,000 people during COVID have given their lives to Christ from these messages on the weekend. So I want to encourage you to pass this message on. This week, tell somebody about it. And if you'd like to get involved in helping show mercy through our food banks or helping us with uh, helping other parents, we're going to be coming to you. If you're a, a grandparent, we're going to need you. We're going to need grandmas and grandpas. We're going to need retired teachers. We're going to need a lot of you to help families in our church and in our community in the next days ahead. Thank you guys for listening in to this message. I'm going to be with you again next week. God bless you. Gracias por estar con nosotros el día de hoy. Y te animo a que lo que escuchaste hoy, lo que Dios te habló a tu corazón, tú lo puedas llevar en práctica esta semana. Estaré orando por ti. Y te quiero recordar que el próximo domingo empezamos a las 11 a.m. Cada domingo a las 11 a.m. Iglesia en Casa. Tendremos nuestro servicio en línea, pero también tendremos reuniones para niños y para jóvenes. No te lo vas a querer perder. Así que compártelo con tus amigos, con tu familia y nos vemos la próxima semana a las 11 a Iglesia en Casa. Y si hoy es tu primera vez, Simplemente manda un texto con la palabra primera vez al número 97000. Nos encantaría conocerte y darte pasos para que tú te puedas conectar con la familia de Saddleback en español. Y también si quieres empezar una nueva relación con Jesús, simplemente manda un texto con la palabra New Start al número 99000. Y también si quieres ser parte de todo lo que Dios está haciendo y ser parte de un grupo pequeño, tenemos muchos grupos a través del condado de Orange y también grupos en línea. Si tú quieres participar en un grupo pequeño cada semana, manda un texto con la palabra grupos al número 97000. Y una manera que puedes seguir ayudando todo lo que estamos haciendo en nuestra comunidad es dando tus diezmos y ofrenda. Para hacer eso, ve a saddleback.com slash give y ahí puedes dar tus diezmos y ofrenda. Familia, los extrañamos, pero nos vemos la próxima semana en Iglesia en Casa. Dios te bendiga. <música>